Welcome to this edition of Deep Dish and Tell. I am up here in Rochester, Minnesota with one of my good friends and one of the most influential and interesting doctors in all of medicine. All of aesthetic medicine for sure, but I would say all of medicine. Uh, Dr. Sebastian Cotofono is an MD, PhD, PhD, and if you haven't heard of him, then you're living under a rock. He has written more papers that have contributed more to the aesthetic medicine than any other physician that I know of. Dr. Sebastian Cotofono is an anatomist, and he's changed the field of aesthetic medicine. But there's much more to this man that you're going to learn about today. Sebastian? <laughs> Steve, it's a pleasure to have you here, actually. It's, it's very nice. It's very nice that you come and visit and experience all of this here. It's just great. So I have to say, I'm completely and utterly surprised. I came up here, you know, I, I called you and said I wanted to come here. You said, sure, come up to my place. We'll go into my backyard. We'll make a fire. But you didn't tell me that, like, <laughs> this whole place is created to, like, chop wood, make a fire. So we just worked out. You had me chopping wood. Is that yeah. something you do routinely? Well, first of all, you did a fantastic job. It was it was really great, guys. You should have seen him. It was For city folk, not bad, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, but I mean, it's um, I, I like the outdoors, and, mm. um, and especially in this area, because there are so many trees that unfortunately are dying. I need to do something with it. So yeah. what I did with them, I chopped them down. I used them for firewood, like these ones here in the back. There are some nice burning ash trees. But I also used them for uh, making furniture, like... So you've made all this whole fire pit. You've made all of this. Yeah, yeah, all of this. From yeah. from these wood to, to the to the grill here. Yeah, everything, including putting down the stones around it, fencing it, and the chairs and the benches, and yeah. And I know there's a whole a whole section there of firewood that you've cut up. <laughs> yeah, I mean. That's all handmade, all hand chopped firewood. Um, because what we do in, in the summer, especially in the fall when it's not so hot, um, I, I chop down the trees, cut them into logs, and then chop these logs. And then I store the logs so we have them um, for the winter. So okay, so why? Why, why, do you, why do you spend so much time out here in the woods? Why do you have all these axes? I mean, you are an anatomist, should I be concerned? <laughs> no. <laughs> No, I mean, I do dissecting with uh, 15 blades, not with axes. Oh, okay. <laughs> but um, I, I like the outdoors. I really, yeah. I really like the outdoors. It's, um, it gives me a nice balance to all the time having to focus on, on papers, on research, on yeah. other aspects. And also it gives me a good kind of like area, like a safe haven from being sometimes on stage, having to interact with people on the conferences and all of these things. So it, it gives me kind of like a good, a good balance. So after being on stage, after teaching, after being in that really intense environment, you come back here and you just, this is your retreat. Yeah. And did you grow up like this with outdoors, woods and chopping wood and fishing and... I, I actually did. I did because um, most of the audience knows i mean I'm, i was born in romania in the part of romania that's called transylvania by the way the, the name transylvania is called from uh, transilva the land beyond the forest uh -huh. and um i i grew up in, in in the woods actually with my parents with my grandparents especially my grandpa we used to go very early fishing hunting and making fires living outside learning about the fires how to build a fire and and i have to admit that for the most parts of my life I was not able to do this because I was living in a city I met school you never have time for this one and now finally here in Rochester I was able to rediscover that site and together with Mika we're doing these things really Mika nice. you're your significant other your partner yes, yeah, yes. of three years now <laughs> yes Wow. And I'm, I'm very blessed I'm very fortunate to have found someone that enjoys these things with me because many times you find someone and you have something in yeah, common yeah. But, but having this in common it's like the core sharing the same core it's really okay i definitely really want precious. to get to that but i want to start still with your your background a little bit in transylvania now transylvania is also the home of yeah dracula <laughs> the prince of darkness <laughs> yeah. and um i actually went there once so that's that's how i know it any um correlation there any <laughs> any resemblance <laughs> any relative experience that we should know about or is it just all fun i, I mean Dracula, actually, um, his, his real name was, was Vlad Tsepes, also referred to as Vlad the Impaler. Um, but the interesting thing is that um, the person who was later called Dracula comes from the fact that he belonged to um, a dragon clan. And dragon in Romania is called Dracu. And if you belong to something, you add the, the letters L-E-A to the name. Yeah. So it would be Dracu. Yeah. And then the ending Lea, so it would be yeah. Draculia. 
so that he belongs to that respective clan. And he was kind of like in this clan and he was actually very popular amongst the Romanians. He was very popular because as an emperor, he defended the country against the invading um, Osmanic uh, so forces. So he's kind of a hero in... Yes. Interesting. I mean, of course, I mean, he introduced this, this thing of killing people by impaling them. But, um, but you know, every, every period of time in, in our history had a certain way of killing people. You know, during the French Revolution, they beheaded them. They didn't impale them. Yeah, anymore. so it was nothing unusual what he really did, to be honest no. with you. Yeah, I, I got that sense, too. Yeah. It, was, it wasn't an axe, though. No. <laughs> <laughs> just, just, just checking. All right, so when I come out here, I said to you, Sebastian, pick your favorite beer and your favorite pizza. Because the whole concept of this is that we drink beer and eat pizza. Mm -hmm. So I'm a little kind of confused because you picked Bush Light. Yeah. But you're you're from Romania. You're from Eastern Europe. I mean, this is like where beer comes from. True. And you pick Bush Light. Can you explain that? Well, when um, when I moved to Rochester, I I started to embrace this this country feel, this yeah. feeling here, being here, and and of course we have also developed some friends um, in this area. Kind of like sometimes we go fishing with them, um, and you just pick up what, what what the locals here drink and so I started drinking it um, with them and I liked it so I stick with Bush Light. Okay, so this is another local beer. We called and we said what's the best microbrewery in town is yeah. Thesis Beer Project so I yeah. picked up some of this. This Great. compared to that, cheers, but cheers. this um, I can tell you tastes really good. <laughs> <laughs> this one too. <laughs> All right, so tell me how you, so you leave Transylvania when you're 10 years old, you go to Munich, Germany for schooling. Mm -hmm. Is that where you did med school? Yes, um, I did med school in Munich. Um, it was very interesting because um, in, um, in, in normally when you apply to med school, you are admitted um, in, fall, in the fall semester. Yeah. And um, in Munich, there was a period of time, there were so many students where the university in Munich um, said, well, we're also going to admit students for the summer semester, which is very unusual because normally semester starts in September, but um, they applied students and admitted them into April, so in the summer semester. And what was very special about those students is they had a different curriculum. And one interesting thing about this curriculum was the anatomy curriculum. So what they did at the end of the summer, instead of doing like the regular students, like once or twice a week throughout the whole semester, six weeks intensive anatomy, morning till the afternoon, only anatomy for six weeks. And you participated in this, and this is once you're in medical school, you're taking an anatomy class, you fall in love with anatomy? Yeah, kind of, I, I have to admit, I did fall in love because it was, for me, something that was very precise, it was accurate. The structure has this name, is located there, receives that neural input, that vascular supply, and has this function. So it was very kind of like how it was, very yeah. simple. But then you go on to pursue um, a residency in surgery. Correct, because my big dream always was to become a surgeon. Okay. And um, during med school, what was very significant for me was I didn't like internal medicine. Yes. And because it was some parts were just maybe a little bit, I would call it too wishy-washy. Yeah. It could be this or it could be that, and you cannot really do much about it. But so that's why I said, well, I want to do surgery. So my always my idea was to do surgery. And then throughout med school, I realized, well, not all surgeons are the same. Not all surgical specialties are the same. So I decided for something that I think was really great for me, and it was trauma surgery. And um, so after finishing medical school, I said, I want to become a trauma surgeon. There's no way around this. Even my rotations during med school, I did in trauma surgery and it was just, it was just my thing. I knew it was my thing. And then I finished medical school and then I was thinking, okay, if I start with trauma surgery now, and I knew about working hours because I did rotational shifts in there, I said, mm, I might not have time to do research. So what I want to do is I want to go first to anatomy, start my postdoc, and get some research under my belt, and after that, why, I'm going why to do surgery. research? I mean, you're going to be a trauma surgeon. Why start doing research? I feel I feel that research has something to do with um, with expanding the knowledge of yourself and also of others, and establishing some safe procedures, some um, some guidelines by research. Because there's many things that we don't know, and I don't know what it was at that time. It was always kind of like it, it captured me to discover things, to investigate things, to try to understand things that I don't understand. So you still had an innate curiosity for anatomy and research in particular you thought was important. So essentially you had that calling. Not, not many of your colleagues did at that time, I'm sure. No, I was, I was actually the only one. And, and many, many generations after me 
I don't know anyone from university in Munich who really went into anatomy. Very, very few, very, very few did this. But I, I enjoyed doing research, I enjoyed discovering things. And so I said, well, if I want to be a really good surgeon, a really good surgeon, I want to have research under my belt. I want to work on things that others don't know. I want to give something to not only the patients, but also to the scientific community. So I said, well, I want to do research. So the goal is to be a better surgeon and using anatomy and research to make you a better surgeon. It wasn't the other way around where you're thinking, I'm going to be an anatomy professor. No, no, no. no. It was always no. like anatomy for becoming a better surgeon later. All right, so then what happens? You go into trauma surgery and in Vienna? Well, in... Um, no, what I did is after, after med school, I went to Austria, to Salzburg, okay. um, and I did um, two years of, um, of anatomy research, and then I focused on, uh, on knee osteoarthritis. On what? Knee osteoarthritis. On knee. Oh, knee, knee osteoarthritis. Okay. Totally off. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> totally off. And I did knee osteoarthritis with imaging, with MRI imaging. I did um, these aspects. And, um, and then after two years of having kind of some papers, I said, okay, now it's time. No, it's time. Thank you so much, Anatomy. I'm going back and finally start trauma surgery. Okay. And I did that. And, um, and I loved it. It was amazing. Especially the ER. It was, it was amazing. What did you love about it? I love the fact that um, even though everybody was kind of like headless when a trauma is coming in, you have your algorithm. You have mm -hmm. your, your ABC systems. You have your very structured things. And, and what I most liked about the emergency room was um, you have a lot of patients that you can help immediately. They come in, you stitch them up, and then they're able to leave again. Right. You don't have to admit them. So, so this is what I really enjoyed about, about, about doing um, the R aspects. So then how do you go from trauma surgery to becoming an anatomy professor? Where is that bridge? Well, w during my time in anatomy, I started um, to do research. And, um, and I got some publications under my belt. And in, in Europe, um, if you publish a certain amount of papers, do a little bit of um, medical education, and, and do some other aspects, then you classify for a process that's called habilitation. It's something like a, like a, it, it's more like a PhD kind of like because some some medical schools in Europe to be able to con complete the habilitation you need to have a PhD so it's kind of like it's an add-on and um, this habilitation process ends with um, the venia legendi it's kind of like becoming a professor. Okay, so you wanted to become a professor and that's why you took that route. It was how to say it's not that I wanted to become a professor it the doors during trauma surgery were reopened for me and my previous boss um, in anatomy said don't you want to come back and finish your habilitation in the next three years and uh, that was at the age of 30. so talk about that decision process you're in trauma surgery you're loving it your previous professor or superior says do you want to do anatomy what were you thinking were you like you know what i could be a trauma surgeon in three years or i could be out in practice or I can go back and I can become a professor. What was that thought process? The thought process was um, being, being a professor is a very high academic degree. And being it's already, I mean, it is prestigious, but when you start publishing, you get kind of a little bit the, the sense of the hierarchy within the academic system. Yeah. You always want to reach the next level. Yeah. And the next level was becoming a professor. But I knew if I would stay in surgery, it would take me forever because I need to do research, I need also to do my practice. And so it took me a while, but having this route going back to anatomy, doing my professorship, and then going back to surgery, that was very appealing to me. Okay. I, was not, I did not plan to stay in anatomy. So this was a route, and then you got invited to be a professor at a young age? Yes. And then were you like, okay, surgery is not for me? Because it's a big decision to go from clinical patients to patients who aren't breathing. <laughs> I know, I know, and I have to admit, um, in the years to come, and, and even now, when I think back a couple of years back, I was still playing with the thought of going back and continuing my trauma surgery because it's I, I still I still like interacting with patients with breathing yeah, yeah. patients with cardiac output, and um, I I like interacting with patients. I like helping them. I like and especially I like kids. I liked a lot of kids. I mean, when when there were always problems in the ER with kids needing sutures, they always called me because I was able to deal with them very well. So I always liked interacting with them. So I, I always missed that patient interaction. And even after I made the decision go to stay in anatomy, I always were thinking, well, I still miss it. So it's, it's never gone away. 
So would you ever consider going back to? I would. Really? I would, yes, I would. Okay, it's very not... interesting for those out there looking for a surgical uh, professor. <laughs> so tell me a little bit more. Um, you decide that you want to um, go down this anatomy route and then you, you give up trauma surgery and you full force, you pursue anatomy and you pursue academics. Where were you at? Was this in Europe still? That was, um, that was in Europe, yes. So after, after trauma surgery, I went back to anatomy. And um, during that time, I still continued doing uh, my, my knee research. But at the same time, it was very interesting to me because at that time, a colleague, actually the best friends of my boss in anatomy, um, he was the president of the German Botulinum Toxin Society. At one day, he approached his friend, my boss, and said, listen, can we come with the doctors of our society and inject color into anatomic heads and see if we're really targeting those muscles? And my boss said, yeah, of course. And then he said, well, can we have someone kind of supervising and designing the course? And my boss said, yeah, sure, someone from my team will do it. And then he asked around in a team, who wants to do it? No one wanted to do it. So, as it is in, in surgery, uh, poo poo runs down the hill, it ends up in the lowest person of the hierarchy, which was me. So, because shit runs downhill, you're in aesthetics. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. so, I mean, I, I wouldn't call it this way, but. So you, did, you didn't choose aesthetics, but it, it came to you, which I believe nothing is random, but yeah, it came to you. It came to me, honestly, because no one of my colleagues wanted to write the course script, no one yeah. of my colleagues wanted to be in that course, so I said, okay, it's fine, I'm the youngest. I will take on that task and I designed the course program, I designed the section steps, I wrote, I wrote the course script and then they came and then they injected color into anatomical heads, embalmed heads, not fresh heads and then I performed the dissections and we looked where the color was and they said, oh, your dissections are really nice, um, it's great, we we'll, might come back next year. Next year they came back. But was there a moment here where the light switch went on, you're like, aesthetics, I really like aesthetics, right? I see something here. Yeah, um, so the next year they came back and um, they, in that group of physicians, were the organizers of a very interesting um, course um, of a conference which was called the Life Symposium in Darmstadt, organized by Gerhard Sattler and Sonja Sattler. Yes. They organized that one. Gerhard and Sonja Sattler, who are two well-respected um, dermatologists from yes. Germany, yes. Yes, um, and um, and I mean, Garrett passed away, and I meanwhile, well, it's 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 really sad because he was such a great person, and um, and he and his co-organizer Maurizio Poda, they said, you know what, you do this pretty good. Why don't you come and do it live on stage with us? And I said, okay, I live will do on it. stage dissection or or talking or the the demonstration of the anatomy, yeah. doing it live on stage yeah. with them. And what the year is this? That was in I think it was in two thousand. Um, 10, I think, 2008. 2010. Yeah. So 2010 is your first live demonstration on stage with anatomy dissection. Yeah. Now, for everyone out there who, who doesn't know about Sebastian, he's published uh, 50, 60, 70 articles, more probably in aesthetics. Well, at the moment, I'm at 213. Okay, you see that? 200. <laughs> he's published over 200 articles in aesthetics. He is he has hands down the most prolific anatomist ever in the history of aesthetic medicine, perhaps in general as an anatomist to publish. And his articles have transformed aesthetic medicine. There's no person who's given us more insight and information into what we're doing anatomically than, than Sebastian. And it all started in 2010, the first time you went on, on stage to show yeah. us this. Yeah. So it was the first year when I was there, and then, um, and then they liked it. And then a couple of years later, because the conference was only two years, the, for the next edition they invited me again. And I think the reason why they invited me was because the person, the anatomist they normally worked with, he just didn't respond to his email. Oh my gosh, so all of this is circumstantial. It is. Yeah. It is. Yeah. All right, um, I want to get into more the second half of this, but we got to try the pizza because you recommended a pizza and we came up here and I said, give me your best beer and your best pizza. So the pizza that you recommended was Pasquale. Yeah. And uh, it's because it's... 
it's <laughs> it, it, it's a pizza that's opposite of the video studio where I do my shoots for my podcast and for all of these other things here in Rochester. So we always have this for lunch for the breaks. Okay, so I'm getting this theme here that things just happen to you and you you kind of like it. Yeah. And it's whatever is in front of you, you you're observant and you're like I like it and I kind of go in that direction. It's, it's not so much of you going after it, is it? Or is it? I would I would rather say um, it was given to me. It okay. was it was given to me, and and I feel um, it is a pathway that is designed. And in those moments when people think you need to make decisions, actually this decision is already taken along the path. The only moment that happens in that moment when you when you feel you take the decision, you need to understand why you go that route. It's not that whether you go that route. It's the understanding of why going. That so, do you route. believe that it's fate that you go that route, or do you believe that you predetermine that you pick it? I think you can call it whatever you like. Yeah. But I think um, it is. When I look back, it was always like this: that the way was almost like scripted. And in those moments, I ne I never saw it in those moments. Many times, when I look back now, um, I think, oh, that was a bad decision. For instance, leaving surgery and doing anatomy. Yeah. Um, you know, if I would have stayed in surgery, I would never have been able to support my parents. I would never ended up here in Rochester. I would never actually met Mika. So there are many things that, that in retrospect, were exactly as they should have been. But in that moment, and one of the biggest decisions was actually this year, it's, um, you, you don't understand them in that moment. But if you continue... So you believe in fate to some extent? Yeah, I do. Okay, um, since you brought it up, it led to this year. What do you want to tell us about this year? Well, I well this year after being, I don't know how many, I think twenty, no more than ten years, more than more than ten years in academia, having achieved um, full professorship um, at the Mayo Clinic, um, I decided to leave academia and to open up my own company and to become an independent researcher and consulting in the aesthetic field. How hard is it to leave academia after being in it for over a decade? It's incredibly hard. I still struggle with that decision, um, but I... Why? Well, because this was since I was the beginning of med school. Academia, hierarchy, achieving professorship, achieving chair of a department, that was always the drill. It's kind of like, it's your indoctrinated. This is your way and you need to follow that way. So it's kind of like, when you're, when you're going through that route, it's, it's very simple to see the, 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 top, the top of the mountain. You keep going this route, you get to the top and then you're a professor, you're the chair. And you're kind of good at that and you saw that and it was very easy. But now you've, you've deviated from that and you're finding yeah. your own forest, your own hill, your own mountain. Yeah. You comfortable with that? It's it's difficult, I have to admit that. It's difficult to um, to have these many degrees of freedom yeah. because um, you're not used to this. And if you don't know about this, then you don't actually miss it. Yeah. So for me it was always, because you're in academia, you always think, oh, the industry is so bad, don't work with industry, the industry is biased, everything. Yeah, because they think that there's a terrible bias against industry. They don't see the partnership that sometimes leads to advancement in medicine also. They, they don't. And, yeah. um, and it's always the academic ivory tower. You are there, you are protected. Yeah. Everything is set, the path for the future, the end goal is, is set, everything is set. And, and it gives a certain degree of security. It gives a substantial amount of security. Yeah, so a substantial amount, yeah. And, um, and without that, of course, there's no security, there's nothing. It's just like, what I'm gonna do? And um, I'm starting to get acquainted with the fact that um, I, I'm free now, I can do whatever I like. If I, if I don't wanna work for the next two hours, I can take a break. I mean, I still don't take breaks. I still start working at six or seven in the morning, work until seven or eight in the evening because this was my drill and I okay, still but continue to do it. When you're working, what are you doing? Um, I'm doing exactly the same thing I did before, research. Research, consulting, um, preparing anatomical content. Uh, so um, when you say you're researching, are you in a lab or are you researching theoretically? So um, in, in the past, um, I, I went into the lab myself and I did the experiments. Um, now I have um, research groups all around the world and we all work together. We all work together, we all interact together. We have regular meetings where we decide on a certain project and then... Um, this is this a formal group? No, no, it's just the various groups all around the world. I've, I work with 
with my group in China, work my group in the Netherlands, in Brazil, in Germany was my core group in Spain. Um, we all work together and, and I think this is, this is a different setting where you have in your specific institution, the bubble, there you have your department and there you have your research group and this is kind of like how you collaborate, how you work your right. ideas. But with, with today's society, everything is open. You yeah, collaborate with the whole world. It's global, you interact, you exchange ideas. And with this, we are able as a group to always be on top of the research field. We're able to drive certain ideas, to drive innovations, to, to create new understandings, especially when it comes to, to the clinical aspect. And, and I really enjoy this. And it's nothing new. I mean, used to, I, it just happened along the way that right. it developed like this. So is this an academic model or is it a business model? Like you meet with these different groups, so is, is your goal, okay, let's come up with some new idea and then sell it to industry or sell it to academia? Or is it we're just interested and we want to learn like what the septum of the face is? Exactly. It's, it's just academics. It's, it's just academics. It's academics. It's my, it's, it's my way or I wouldn't say it my way but it's it's the way how I I I I look for research. I was always this investigative You're mind. Curious. Yeah my curious since the beginning. Since yeah. the beginning. Why I went after med school in anatomy because I want to do research. And now I'm still even though I wouldn't have to do research because I'm not an academic institution, I'm not measured by the amount of publications that I publish every year. How now it you're was just in the past. Genuinely curious and you want to you want to do this and push the field forward. Yeah. This is, this is what I do. That, that, that's the heart of what academic medicine is supposed to be. It's not yeah. to get medical students in the residency. It's not to sell more pharmaceutical products. No. It's, n it's not to um, you know, make more money for yourself. It's to actually just push the boundaries of academics and thinking. And you do this all the time with your papers. I mean, I, the amount of papers that you've published that change the way we think about aesthetics is astronomical. It's, I will, I always tell this, every time I give a lecture and I, I mention you, I'll mention your name multiple times because I reference you all the time. I always tell people, if you want to spend a great weekend and you really want to know what you're doing in aesthetics, download 25, 30 of your publications, spend the weekend reading Sebastian Cotofono's publications, <laughs> you will become a better aesthetic physician at the end. Because there's so many things you bring up, I'm like, oh my gosh, that explains it. And I can think over and over again, again, all these papers from lifting, you know, superficial injections to the facial septum and how it influences the amount of blood flow back to the face to treatment around the mandible. I mean, so much of what we do now in aesthetic medicine is based on the layers that you created and showed us of where to put product. How about safety? Like a lot of our safety measures is because of you, because you showed us where those vessels are and how to be safe so we don't inject intravascularly. Well, but again, it's, I, I didn't, I didn't, actively look for this. It was just given to me. One idea led to the other. One project led to the other. One collaboration led to the other. It just, it just happened. Okay, but you make it sound like you sit back and these things happen to you. Aren't you driven? I mean, of course. I'm very ambitious. Those who know me and those who work with me, uh, they always know um, the one slogan that I always say in my research groups. I always say, research is not a democracy. There's one PI and there's one direction. So because I mean, of course I'm driven, of course I'm ambitious, of course I work hard and everybody who works with me, yeah. they know um, how driven I am. But, but I feel in, in those moments, um, it's just a feeling that, oh, here could be something. Let's go into that direction. Tell me about research in today's world. Is it different from what it was when you started 10 years ago? Is it different from historically what research is? And where do you see research going? Oh, this is this is a great question. I I feel um, starting from now, I feel research has a much better standing, especially in aesthetic medicine, and especially the the the, the word evidence based. It's increasingly more popular. It's increasingly more accepted, and people are looking for this. And what I'm very happy about, especially in aesthetic medicine, is that we're moving slowly, slowly away from eminence based medicine. And, and in the past, there was no research. In the past, when, when we started injecting fillers or toxins, there was nothing. It was just like, this is how I do it. And if it worked, cool, let's continue this That's way. That's the way it had to be, because there was no such thing as placebo randomized control trials exactly. in aesthetics. Exactly. It was just like this. And there's nothing wrong about it. Right. It's just nothing wrong about it. But just by empiric and logical thinking and critical thinking, some certain guidelines and rules and, and, and algorithms were established. And now with the influx of researchers into this field, which I also embrace very much, um, we start to have the 
better trials. We start to have um, theoretical and basic science research. We have mathematical models that try to explain injection techniques. All of this is happening at the moment, and this sometimes um, supports what everybody's doing, and sometimes it just creates a little bit of a challenge. And this is kind of like the difficult thing, kind of how to embrace this new knowledge, this new understanding, if we always did it like this. Okay, let's talk about evidence-based medicine a little bit deeper, because this is a hot-button issue across all medicine today, certainly with um, a lot of being sponsored by pharmaceutical agencies. Can evidence-based research come out of just physicians like yourself doing research without support, without financial support from pharmaceutical companies? Um, the answer is uh, the answer is yes. I mean, um, I do this all the time. Um, the almost all of my research is independent of companies, and the reason giving is, um, of course, I could I could ask for a company and hey, please give me product. I want to test this injection technique. No, I don't. I'm looking for collaborators who are willing to donate their own product and their own time into this research project, so, so it's not um, it's not influencer biased. And with this, I assure that I'm independent of the industry, that the things that I say and that I write in my papers, which I all, by the way, write myself, um, that this is unbiased, that it's not influenced, that I can still, that I'm able to be neutral and that I'm able to provide unbiased research. How common outcome. is that in medicine today to have unbiased evidence, whether it's in our journals or, or other journals? It is. It, it is rare, it has to be admitted, but I don't think industry support has to be condemned at all. Not at all. I, I don't think so because there, there are these these types of um, projects like the IITs or like IIS, where where the investigator um, brings forth an idea to a company, and then a company says, "Okay, we'll provide you with money for um, for body donors, and then you can do that research." For instance, the, the my my very very first publications on effect compartments. Um, I was not able at that time to the effect compartments of the of the, the ones on the thigh or the face. Which on one? the face. On the face. On okay. the face. Yeah. yeah. In the beginning, I was not able to um, to have money to 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 buy the donors to conduct this research. But a company supported me in buying the donors, and that was all of the support. Right. But what I did with those donors and all of the experiments and the conclusions drawn were all independent from the industry. Okay, so I think this is an important distinction here. They call it independent investigator-initiated studies or investigator-initiated trials. I have a research company, as you know, so we do a lot of these also. I'm with you. I think these are really important. This is when I have an idea or you have an idea. We write a protocol, we write a grant, and we may send it to a, a sponsor. Some people send it to the NIH. We may send it to a, a, a company, and we may say, this is an idea we have. It's out of my mind. It's what I've noticed clinically. Can you help fund this? And it's not necessarily, we don't make money off it. It just covers the cost of doing the treatment exactly. and doing the study. And in the end, if, if our idea is good, then it may lead to a breakthrough in that product being used or that pharmaceutical uh, agent being used. Yeah, but on the other side, it also has to be distinguished when it comes to a certain um, product usage, product safety injection technique, that's one part. But when for instance, when you look on, on anatomy, I mean, no company can influence if that the facial artery right. is here or there. I mean, right. this is just like basic anatomy research. This is basic science and no company can influence this. So where do you think the future of research goes right now? Do you think it's going to be academic? Do you think it'll be in the private practice? I, I do think, especially in an aesthetic field, that the research and, and the, the knowledge um, production, it will shift away from the academic component. Why? One of the reasons is because academic institutions, they don't believe in aesthetics. They always have aesthetic like, like almost like a like it, you know, like yeah. oh, that has nothing to do with science. If you try to apply to the NIH with an with an aesthetic study, I mean, how high are the probability that you get approved? They're very low. When right. you compare this to stem cell cancer or to neuro research, right. I mean, you always lose against those in a competitive. Yeah. So, and I do think also the academic institution they don't really take aesthetics very serious because it's just they don't take it serious and. And I do think that this has opened up research from the private sector, from the non-academic part. And I see this all the time. I mean, a lot of my papers are with um, private practices from all over the world which want to do research, which want to advance the field. And why should they be stopped? They have great ideas. They work very hard. Why should not they be included into the academic circle? Why not? How important is this aesthetic research or and now and has been to um, pushing the field forward, to progressing and advancing the field. It's it's crucial. It's it's the alpha and the omega of this field. Okay, give me examples. 
for instance, um, when, um, when it comes to, let's say, toxin injections, right? We did, we did it for years, kind of like certain things here, you inject here, here, you inject here, you want to avoid the lower aspect of the forehead because um, you can drop the eyebrows. Right. And uh, there was injection algorithms, FDA approval, everything um, was done like this, but there was no idea why. Until two or three years ago, we came up with the concept of the, of the um, line of convergence with the C line, which showed okay, that the line of convergence. Yeah. A little quick explanation for those people who, are, who don't know what that is. So, um, guys, if you look in my forehead and I'm frowning my frontalis muscle in my forehead, you can see that my hairline goes down and my eyebrows go up. Eyebrows go up, hairline goes down. And this works only because I have no toxin in my forehead. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, if I, if I try to do this um, in, uh, you me? yeah, you can do it. I don't have it either. Yeah, but if I if I try to ask this uh, to participants in my courses, sometimes I study courses. I'm trying to do this. No one can do yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, psh, or guys, try to look angry so we look at glabella uh, glabella contractions. You can. Yeah. Participants never. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Which model should I use for my course? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So the combined convergence is a septal. Is a well. You explain it better than me. Yeah. So I mean, it's just. It just um, it separates the frontalis muscle into two portions: the upper yeah. part, which acts as a hairline depressor, and the lower part, which acts as an eyebrow elevator. And if if you understand this, you also know where the separation is between the two parts. And if you understand where the separation between the two parts is, you know what happens if you inject too much neuromodulators in the lower aspect, right. you drop the eyebrows, and you know exactly when you inject at the line and above, you have no influence on the eyebrows. So this was anatomy, this was research that you helped uh, uncover that's changed the way we inject. Of all the research you've done, which is quite a bit, and so much of it innovative and new, what are you most proud of? I think um, the paper you're like this is the paper that you know I worked really hard on. I figured it out. This really has made a difference. I think I think the line of convergence is um, is one of them, but I also like the transverse facial septum. Okay. Which exactly that's that's this component here that runs under zygomaticus major because I feel this septum um, for me it for the first time introduced something into the into the facial anatomy, into facial aesthetics, which um, I called facial biomechanics. The term is a little bit older, but it was referred to EMG and, and face movements. But the term facial biomechanics opens actually also the fourth dimension of anatomy. The fourth dimension is? Time. Time. So it's the change per time. Because for instance, best example, the, the glabella arteries, which we always think they're very dangerous with the supratrochlear and the supraorbital. Um, supraorbital, supratrochlear, the arteries that go here that are large that connect to the internal carotid system and they can be dangerous if injected. Correct. Yes. Yes. So these arteries, um, they're mobile. When we frown, they're in a different location and we're relaxed. So they change their position. And the factor that influences this is time. So it's mobility. The same thing with aging. The facial soft tissues are in a different place in mature patients than in young patients because of the effects of time. So the effects of time on the body that it ages, it changes, its, the, the anatomy changes the position of the vessels Correct. over age. Okay, so it's what you see in a 70 year old is not what you see in a 25 year old. Correct. So, and if you think about, when you talk about the various dimensions, I mean, you have the two dimensions with left and right up and down, like in a Cartesian coordinate system, X and Y. In this okay. way you explain this is medial, this is lateral. But then in anatomy, we started to introduce the next dimension, the third dimension, which is depth. So we need to think about the layers, which we, I also published plenty on this one, kind of understanding that, well, in a temple superficially, you can inject subdermally, but if you go deeper, there might be an artery. So understanding the same two-dimensional location, but a different three-dimensional location can have different outcomes. Right, so there's, you've defined five different layers uh, of the temporal and where to put the filler makes a big difference in the safety of it. So it's really important to know that anatomy. Thanks and, to you, yeah. And, and the same thing on the lips. Yeah. We know that the artery in the most cases, it runs deep. And if we think about two dimensions, say, okay, this is the two dimensions, medial and lateral, but you can still inject here if you change the plane, if you yes. change the depth. So this is the introduction of the third dimension. And now if you think about, you add the factor time in, you know that lips change as we age. So that means the treatment is different in a young lip than in an advanced lip or a mature lip, because you need to have different aspects and also safety aspects change and many aspects. So this is kind of like introduction 
and introducing the fourth um, dimension, especially with mobility, especially with the transverse facial septum, kind of made me understand that everything in the face is mobile. You need to always see a different mobility and see the different aspect of it. Okay, so back to what you're most proud of. 215 articles. What do you say? This is the one I'm proud of. I think, I think um, the line of convergence, that is, um, that is a good one. But I have to admit, I just recently published another one, which I think um, was, I'm, I'm very proud of that one, that we finally got that one accepted, because it was so complicated. It was so complicated and I didn't understand it. And, um, and it, it took me quite a while to understand it, but now that it's out, it's, I'm very proud of this, that I was able to, to manage that. Which article? The, 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 the transverse septum article? Or? No, the one that we just recently published was um, with, um, with a research group in, in Russia. Um, we designed a mathematical model to mimic um, injection techniques to think about the constant needle motion injection technique. The perception that safety is increased during needle injections when you constantly move the needle in and out. Is not true. It's not true. Okay, so that's important because you've come, you, you've shown that a lot of anecdotal um, opinions are not proven to be true with needle movement and different types of injection styles, whereas you have shown that cannulas are much safer. And I know that because I'm a proponent of cannulas, but it's great to see your evidence base to show what is actually safer because that helps all of aesthetic medicine. Yeah, and I think... To me, that's what I'm most proud of what you've done is I think you've, you've advanced the safety of aesthetic medicine. Yeah, and I, I mean, that one was a very important article. Yeah. I mean, that was kind of like comparing the different um, penetration forces poking into the yeah. arteries. I think that was, that was an important one. But, but, but this recent one, um, the constant needle uh, motion technique, um, it's, it, sometimes it's really hard to, to provide evidence for claims that were just at some point introduced along the path of aesthetics. So at some point, because we always did it without any proof, we introduced that technique and then we keep it and we assume right. that this is the gold standard safer standard. Because someone says it's the great way to do it, but it not necessarily is. So I want to talk to you about the politics of publications because there's a lot and it's normal. What, what are your thoughts on that? I think, I think um, publishing a research article is, is a lot of work. I think, I think most people out there um, that don't publish, they don't know how much work it is. Right. I mean, it's like, it, it, takes, it takes months and months to design only a study, yes. to get everybody on board. And then it takes also months to complete the study and then it might not take very long, but it's very complicated to write this, to do the stats, write the paper. You also need to have the f certain things. And once you have everything ready, um, all of the co-authors, they, um, they look onto the paper and they prove that everything is fine. And, and, and only then, when everybody approves, then you can submit it to the journal. The way you select a journal, I, um, I always look for, for the journal which is most fitting. If it's more towards the aesthetic side, I always pick one journal, if I go most to the surgical side, I pick another journal, and then um, and then you submit it, and then and then here comes the thing. What I think is very important is other people look at it. Other people that don't know you, that don't know who wrote the paper. It's a blinded process. They look on to the manuscript. Everything is blinded, and then they judge it. They evaluate it. Is it well written? Is it sound? Is the conclusion statistics correct? Is everything fine? And then um, yeah, and then and then they get back to you with comments. Said, I don't like this. You need to rewrite this. You need to rewrite this, and then the peer review process. Yeah, is what you're talking about. Yes. yes. Okay. Once the paper is out, then it's out, and then um, people can read it, and then um, and then of course people have comments on it, which I think is is important. People can comment on it, and unfortunately, the way how it is today is um, there's social media. I think it's a blessing, but it's also sometimes it's a curse, because on social media then people can unfiltered express their opinion on certain things. And I welcome opinions. I think opinions are great, but when, for instance, in my personal opinion, when you have an opinion about the paper, there are, there are ways to express your opinion on this paper, like a letter to the editor, like a commentary, and journals encourage this. And, and I welcome this, because sometimes you really learn from other people when they write a commentary. What On social media or within the journal process? Well, if it's a published paper, then that is the platform, and then letters to the editor, everything should stay within that area okay. of the journal. But 
Recently, it just happens that people then take a paper and then trash it on social media because they don't like it, because they were not included as a number at the end of a sentence or because they think it was their idea or whatever. I mean, there are the many ideas or because they just disagree. Is this a bad thing or a good thing? I do, I do think um, expressing opinions on certain topics is a good thing. We are a pl pluralistic society, everybody should have an opinion and freedom of speech, it should be open. But I do think there should be the right channels for it. And so social media may not be the right channel to criticize some of these papers? I, I, I don't think that that's, that's, the right, that's the right channel. I don't think so. If, if you disagree with, with certain things that are written in a scientific paper, um, then there are ways to do it. There are ways to express your concern or express that something was done or express, well, hey, I was the first, because then this opens up uh, an academic discussion, not the social media discussion where everybody can bash and trash and do those things and kind of say unqualified comment, even though they have not ever read that respective um, or, paper. Or have deep knowledge on the topic and they come off like they're experts because they have a million followers. Well, this is the other point, um, which is one of the things in, um, in aesthetic medicine. I'll, I'll get back to the politics of publishing. Yeah. But, but for instance, in social media, what happens these days is um, the opinions are most valued, most respected and most accepted of those who have the largest amount of followers. And, and if you think about this, kind of like, let, let's say someone in your family has a heart attack and you want to find a qualified cardiologist. You would look someone for academic accolades, for in a respective institution, you would look some. You wouldn't look on social media who has the majority of the followers. Who has the most followers? That's the best cardiologist for my father when he has a heart okay, attack. Okay, but uh, so I'm, I'm agreeing with you, but you, you can't not look at what's happened over the last three or four years with COVID and how some people were misled by opinions, whatever side you're yeah. on, in academia. I, I agree. I agree. I mean, this is, this is, um, this is the other side of the coin, because um, some nothing, nothing is truly kind of like always and should be stated for a, for for correctness. You yeah. should always have critical thinking. You know, always think right. about certain things, and you should always kind of think: Is it really like this? Is it really correct what they're just writing? I think that's absolute crucial for our society. Do you believe in suppressing? information on social media or in academia and that's that's a difficult question um i i do think um that it happens i'm um, i'm not sure about the reasons the those who do this might have their reasons and those reasons might not be understood for others and in someone's opinions it's justified in other opinions it's not justified but i think um we're in a pluralistic society, so there have to be different opinions and there have to be critical thinking to evaluate those things. You know, when I first when, um, went into aesthetic medicine in the early 2000s, I was writing about the emotional and psychological influences and impact of the treatments we do. I, I kept all the rejection letters I got. Where they said, we are not psychiatrists, we are plastic surgeons, we don't care about how they feel, we care about how they look. And I kept all those and I highlighted them and I'm framed in my office now because to me that seemed like that's all that mattered or mostly mattered. And it was considered heretical thinking, I got rejected, yeah. I wasn't given an opportunity to speak at surgical conferences. Fast forward 20 years later, patient reported outcomes and how people feel about themselves and the procedures are now very much a standard in every aesthetic trial. Sometimes it takes a while for these things to come through but I, I felt a little bit of that at a time, and I, I kind of understand that feeling of being suppressed when you have an idea that you're so convinced is true. Um, so how does someone who's got an idea, thinks it's great, but isn't allowed to get it through? Like, what, where do they go? If, if the powers that be in academia or the journal editors say, well, this idea is misinformation. I think, I think there, there, there's one important caveat to this one. Um, if, if the person is convinced it's a great idea, um, it's a personal opinion and in today's society we need to think about levels of evidence. There are various levels of evidence and the lowest level of evidence, level number five, is personal opinion. So it's kind of like I have an opinion about certain yes. things and which can be generated throughout the last 20 years and for you it might be valid. Right. But there are certain criteria of how science 
there are rules of science. It needs to be reproducible. It needs to be kind of like published in this way. It needs to be conducted in this way. So there are certain rules for every, every, every research paper. And then, of course, when, for instance, you, instead of having your own opinion, you do a case series. You investigate multiple cases in a very constructed way, kind of like a certain way, objectively assessed, and then you report that outcome. That's already a case series. That's the next level of evidence, level of evidence four, which is a better level of evidence. And and this this is there's a pyramid of until you get to one and with sub subclassifications. But I do think these levels of evidence are very important. And what happens on social media many many times is just personal opinions. Yes. Level of evidence five. And on the other side, when you go through a peer-reviewed process with a publication, it's not only you. There were other people who had looked at this, yes, yes. who had classified this. And then if you come out with a peer-reviewed paper that is published, um, which is more than just a personal opinion, then there is a different level of evidence. So what I'm getting from you on this and, uh, is that you had a great idea. You can talk about it on social media. But if you really want to have, if you really want to say it works, it's real, it's true, then do the studies, do the science. Yeah. And there's a pathway to do that science, which, I, you know what, I, I follow that. I did that also. I started yeah. creating studies on it, and eventually the studies started catching on, and then large clinical trials came to follow. But you, you can have a great idea, and you can have your opinions out there, and you can put it all over social media, but prove it if you want to get accepted. And don't just, you know, throw out there all these horrible, like, insults against people who are, who are going against you. It's like, um, Ignaz Semmelweis, you know, the, the yeah. person who, well, you yeah. probably know who he is, right? Yeah. He was convinced that, you know, you had to wash your hands to prevent bacteria being transferred during pregnancy. And he didn't know why, because it was before the Louis Pasteur discovered the germ theory. And nobody believed in him. He was this chaotic, crazy guy who went up in the insane asylum and died and was pretty much demeaned by all of academia at the time. But he never proved what he was saying. He just, it was his ideas. Yeah, I feel... I feel you just have to play by the rules of society or by the or rules science, or right. science. Yes, yeah. you just have to play by those rules. There are certain established rules um, which you have to play with. And, and I think this is, this is really important, I think, to follow those rules. And, and of course, um, when, you, when you think about social media, I mean, it's, it's, it's a curse and it's a blessing. It, it's on both sides. But if you think about it, um, you, can, you can vent and you can state whatever you like out there because it's unfiltered. But when you then start to enter academic discussion, you need, you enter a different game. And that game has different rules. Yeah. And then if you want to play that game, then play by those rules. And most of the social media people don't enter into that world because they're not comfortable there, because they can't back it. That, yeah, I mean, I see that. And I have to admit, with, with being so long in academia and conducting so many studies and trials, I'm familiar with those. But on the other side, um, you know, it's on social media, if, if, there are, if there are people, there are thought leaders like you, like, like all of these other amazing thinkers in this field, they need to understand that they have a certain degree of responsibility. They have a responsibility of not misleading yeah. others to follow them into a path that is not backed up. You need to have evidence right. for what you say. You cannot just say, well, I don't do this because I did it for 20 years. That's not right. sufficient. Right. You need, to, you need to follow certain pathways and rules of the game that you're playing. And also, especially the opinion leaders, they, they, they need to understand that they have a responsibility for others. They are thought leaders. And their thoughts, because they are thought leaders, because they assume that responsibility, they, they assume that position. Every position comes with a certain degree of responsibility. You have to have the responsibility of not misleading others by providing them just level, level of evidence five. You can't. Personal opinions is not sufficient anymore. All right. Um, I want to finish up with this, but first I, wanna, I don't want to let our pizza get cold. So this yeah. is the pizza we chose, and we're so engaged in conversations, hard to get to it. So I got Pasquale's, your pizza you chose. Yeah. Uh, and I got just cheese. What did you get? I got uh, pepperoni and uh, champignons and mushrooms. Champignons. Champignons. <laughs> mushrooms. So I want to... Um, follow up with this because you brought up something about key opinion leaders and it's key opinion leaders is kind of a it's a touch point and it's a it's it's a word that some people don't like to hear yeah um, and what is a key opinion leader exactly do you think that a key opinion leader is someone who becomes one or do they do they pursue being a key opinion leader or are they labeled a key opinion leader like how, how does one become a key opinion leader mm. It's that like, is someone an influencer, hi, I'm an influencer, or is that 
they get called an influencer. I think or they become an influencer by you know by their actions and who they, what they do. Yeah. I think I think um, this is a title that's been given from others to you. Okay. You cannot you cannot say yourself, well, I'm a key opinion leader. No, it doesn't work. I mean, what happens is you need to do certain things or achieve certain things or behave certain way or do some certain things that qualify you to be called by others this way. It's not it's not like something that I'm a key opinion leader. So you don't put on your resume or on your social media, I'm a key opinion leader. <laughs> no, of course not. Then you're not really one. Ah, just because you don't have a label, it doesn't mean you're not. I always say that knowledge is something you have, but wisdom is something that someone call, ha, someone gives to you. You don't say, I have wisdom. Wisdom is something that others call you. Yeah. Does that make sense? I yeah. agree. I agree. Yeah. I agree. There, there are many things that that you have to earn, but but others people, other people or other institutions, they, they just give it to you right. if you reach a certain degree. Otherwise, I mean, of course, it comes with a certain status, it comes with a certain prestige, with whatever. But but this this shouldn't be the motivation. So, what is a key opinion leader in your in your definition? I think I think a key opinion leader, especially in our field, when we talk about KOLs, is um, is someone who who has achieved certain things, has left an imprint that is specific to that respective person, like becoming an individual scientist, an individual injector, an individual clinician in certain features. And by individual, I mean something very specific about that respective person that cannot be reproduced by others, that's irreplaceable, that's very special about it. And once you have that status, then yeah, like, this is great, what this person do? He, I, I respect his opinion. He's a leader in that thought process. So he or she thinks something that then elevates them to a position and people respect what they say. And then you said something interesting earlier, that they have a responsibility. Yes, they do. They and that's do. part of being a, a key opinion leader in your, in yes. your mind? Yes, it, that, that is a responsibility. It just comes with the title, with the job. It just comes with that respective component. Um, and it's something you don't ask for it. Right. You don't ask for it, it's given to you. And unfortunately, a lot of people are not aware of this. A lot of people aren't aware of this, that what they say can influence other people's thinking and action. And when you have that, that status, that you can do this to other people, you need to be aware of what you do. You need to be aware of what effect can come after the things that you say and things you do. Because people might do things that are dangerous or not in the patient's best interest because someone said it on social media flippantly. Yeah, I mean, it's it's like a bias, you know, like you're like in a bubble. You're like in a bubble, there's the key opinion leader, and then there are the followers. And whatever that key opinion leader says, the followers will do it. Independent critical thinking or not, but they will do it. So you need to be very careful what you do and what you say. Do you think the future will still have key opinion leaders? Or do you think this concept of key... Because it didn't exist when I was coming through medicine. I mean, there were just a few doctors who were well-known for doing certain plastic surgery procedures. But it wasn't like it is today where it was almost celebrity-like. Do you think that this is something that will continue or do you think it's just a blip in time? I think I think it's just a matter of time. A matter of time when, when people have this status. I, f I hope that in the future it will change. Because if you compare it to other medical specialties, you don't have the celebrity sort of like we have this in aesthetic yeah. medicine. I mean, you have people kind of like, when they go on stage, other people are like, ooh, and they want to take pictures with you, like, like really like celebrities. So I, I want to set this up because I've been all around the world with you on stages everywhere. And I've seen you since your beginning of your career to now. And it's amazing. Like, after you speak, there is a line out the door to take pictures with you everywhere in the world, whether Asia, Europe, Middle East. It's it's unbelievable to watch and you are a fantastic communicator from the stage you really do a good job because you take a concept that's very difficult to understand you make it very simple to understand and then you also show the practicality of it this is why it's important to you in the past we had anatomy lessons this is where all the vessels are you say this is why it's important to know where this vessel is and this is how it affects your influences your treatment and this is how it influences the outcome and then afterwards you, you, such, you communicate it so well and so easily your slides are great there's lines of people to see you do you like it? Um, I didn't ask for it. Example, I like to go fishing, but I don't like the smell of fish on my hands after I catch a fish. <laughs> okay, that's, okay, no, that's, that's a stretch. Give no. me the analogy. How does it get back to people stand, lay, standing in line to see you? <laughs> so look, I like to teach, I like to educate. Yeah. I didn't ask for, for the lines. I didn't ask for 
I wouldn't call it fame. I, d I didn't ask for any of those. Yeah. It was just given to me. Yeah. The same thing, I like go fishing. I like to go with Mika fishing. So we just, after work, we just go fishing, catch a fish. But then when we drive back home in the car, then our hand smells like fish. Yeah. I mean, I don't like that smell. Yeah. So I didn't ask for the smell, but I like fishing. So the same thing, I like educating people. I like, I like teaching them. I like to make an impact on the way how they treat patients because right. this is kind of my, they are my extended arm of treating patients because I'm still a physician. Yeah. And I didn't ask for it. It just, it just happened. But I also know that there is a certain responsibility coming with it. And um, I embrace it. I accept it. It's a part of the job. It's a part of being a KOL. Mm -hmm. And I, I will kind of like if if someone is asking me for a picture and I have the time and it, it just allows for that component then then yes because I also need to understand I mean you know I I would I would be too shy to ask anyone for a picture I would be just too shy I would like oh my goodness I, I would never even but but it takes a lot of courage to go up to someone and and then then to ask hey is it okay if you take a picture and then I have to understand this. I want to understand this. What is the motivation? And of course, yes, yes. Let's. See. And I've always seen you be very gracious when people come up to you. Is I that mean, genuine? I think, I think it's, it's. I mean, you need to understand why they do this. And if you understand, then you have empathy. And then, then yes, of course, I'm I'm tired after the thirtieth picture that I take. You know, but the person was at the end of the line. They already ate it for fifteen, twenty minutes. Right. Why should I just, because I don't want to stand 10 more seconds for the last picture, yeah. why should I refuse and, and disappoint them? No, I mean, yeah. come on. I mean, these 10, 15 minutes, 15 seconds for another picture, it's okay, they waited for 20 minutes. Did you ever imagine you'd be doing that when you were <laughs> anatomy in the lab in <laughs> Germany? No. No way. No way. As I said, I never asked for it. It was yeah. given to me. Where do you enjoy speaking the most? Is there a conference or a part of the world that, you know, this part of the world really, they're a great audience. I love speaking to them. Um, I love speaking Latin America. I okay. love speaking Latin America. It's um, because the the level um, of knowledge and the critical thinking is very high there. Yeah. And I love it. I love interacting. I love. I love. And I actually, it's all around the world. When I get critical questions, when I when I when I have people coming up to me and say, "Hey, I disagree with this," and I ask, "Okay, why?" And then I'm trying to understand where they're coming from. Maybe they have a great idea. Maybe they have a better idea. It's not like. I'm the rule, it's not. It's just like, I just want to understand where they're coming from. And if they have a bad idea, well, okay. Then, and I want to give you an example. Um, in 2017, um, I published a paper about the course of the angular vein. And I published and I wrote in that paper that the vein travels in a supraperiosteal plane in a tear trough. A couple of years later, I found out I was wrong. Because the vein travels inside the muscle. And the reason why we found that out because we used ultrasound. So we found out that the vein is inside the muscle and the vein is not in the supraperiosteal plane. So this is why cannula injections in the tear trough deep in contact with the bone, you don't, you're not at risk of, of injuring the vein mm -hmm. because the vein is a plane higher, okay. coming back to two and three dimensions. And, um, and it's okay to be wrong in the past because it doesn't matter if you're right or wrong. It matters what is the better outcome for the future for the patients. Right. Example with, with the relationship. You know, if you have, if you have fights with, with your partner, um, it doesn't matter who's right or wrong. It's about the relationship. It's not you or her. It's not about being right. It's about the relationship. But you have to be willing to admit you're wrong about the anatomy. Yes. How and about I, with your partner? Are you willing to admit you're wrong? All the time. <laughs> all the time so it goes both ways you have to be willing to admit you're wrong both with the partner and, and with an enemy yes. but but it this kind of this this implies that that you still at some point you need to stay open you need right. to stay open yeah. even in research even what we thought i mean just think about it. it's a yeah. repetitive pattern in research what we thought 50 years ago was the dogma now we're changing it but the idea is not about me having developed that research is my i contribute to something it's like a train. I contribute to something, but the train is continuing. Right. Sign and knowledge is continuing. So you have to be able to contribute and to sometimes also accept, well, I was wrong. That's why I hate absolutes in medicine, because we always know medicine, you hedge, because things change all the time. And whatever we think today, it's almost for sure going to change. I heard recently that Einstein's theory may be, may be challenged, you know, and that maybe we can travel faster than the speed of light, which he said was impossible. You know? Who knows? Who right. knows? But I think the most important, I think, and what you said is absolutely correct. One of the constant things 
in life and also medicine has changed. So you're, you're deep into anatomy, you're working on all kinds of specimens, um, you see things that most of us never see and you conceptualize it differently than us. Does it make you more or less religious? That is a good question, which comes to the point of monism and, and dualism. Um, mm -hmm. I, it, I have to admit that, um, that this, is, this is a difficult question. And, and especially because when I combine my experience as an anatomist and as a trauma surgeon, and as a trauma surgeon, um, you are next to the patient, the patient is alive, heartbeat is going, and then a couple of minutes later, the patient is not alive anymore. The heartbeat has stopped, blood flow has stopped, the patient is starting to turn cold, and you are right next to it. And, and what happened is this, this piece of meat just turned from a living to a non-living individual. And, and then the question is, what happened? What happened during this transition? And, and I have to admit, um, it's, it's a really tough thing to conceptualize the transition period, what we call dying. Um, this from a living individual to non non-living individual, and I've seen both both sides. And when I look at the non-living individual, it's 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 like you you learn anatomy from it. It's um, it's a body, still has human dignity. You have to treat it with ethics. You have to pay it the highest respect. But it's not living anymore. And the question is, what is the difference? And and sometimes when I explain it in my courses, I say, well, the person who was living in this body previously has decided to move out. Now it's moving out to another apartment. So this apartment is empty. So now we can use that apartment and learn anatomy from it. So the question is always, was it always there or was it not always there, the question of God? And, and I have to admit, I, I, I used to think a lot about those aspects and I do think that there, again, very personal, I do think that there's, there's something that brings it to life and that something comes and goes. It's very similar like, to, to a glove. You, the glove is like just a piece of, of, of latex. You put your hand in it, then it's alive, it's a glove, and then you take the hand out of it. And this thing that goes in and out, it's, um, there's something. So then you believe that there's a spirit that lives on after you die? Um, yes, absolutely. So then you are religious? Well, you know, with religion it comes many other connotations. True. But, um, Thinking that there is something, yes, absolutely. Do you go to church? I do. Every week? No, no, because most of Sundays I'm on stage. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but yeah, I do, I do, and I, I don't think I don't think that being religious or spirituality um, is something that happens in a certain location or it happens in a certain right. place or time. Of course, it helps to conceptualize certain things. It's like when when children try to learn um, a poem by heart. Yeah. You need to repeat it over and over again, then you have it. Yeah. And this is kind of like how many times are certain religious features or acts or things that you do, kind of they repeat them over so you can internalize them. But I don't think that it always has to happen in a certain time in a certain spot. It's something, sometimes when you, when you have the feeling of you feel very connected, it can happen in that moment. Mm -hmm. And it's a very similar feeling. And you're working with people who've donated their bodies to science. What are your thoughts on that? I think it's it's an incredible incredible gift that those people have done while alive because I mean you just need to think about it the first thing is while you're alive you and me like all of others here um we're thinking we're going to die I mean I don't think about that very often actually never but I know it's going to happen because death is a part of life like birthdays like marriage like like everything like birth of a child everything is just a part of life so death is a part of life and those people knew about this. They understood this while alive, that they will die at some point. And they understood when they're moving to a different apartment, the body is still there. And they thought their body can benefit others. They can benefit doctors, students, allied healthcare professionals, and to increase the knowledge and then to help the living. So you need to imagine what incredible gift that is to give your body to a stranger not knowing what he will do to your body. Would you donate your body to science? Absolutely. You would? Ab absolutely. That you says a lot. But, I mean, it just shows you respect for what you do and for the people that you treat, or that you share with us. You know, you know what the thing is, is I mean, when, 
when I move somewhere else, these things here, this muscles, this skin, this flesh, this can, this can help others. So why not making that gift, that benefit to others? Why not? What does the future hold for uh, Dr. Sebastian Cotofono? Are you, um, let's talk pro pro professionally first, but what is the future? You're in Rochester, Minnesota right now. You're chopping wood. You've created all of this. You're living uh, a wilderness lifestyle here. I mean, and we'll have to show some of this footage here of all these, <laughs> All this wood you've chopped, this huge backyard, you, um, you're out here fishing, you're out here uh, sledding in the winter, snow, uh, snowshoeing and, and cross-country skiing. Is this, the, is this the future? Are you going to live in this area with this fence and this forest and have a bunch of kids and live here personally and then professionally, do you see yourself practicing academics from here? Well, um, I mean, about the future, there's always the decision that you never take alone. I mean, I will take this decision together with Mika if we're gonna. So be Mika here. being your partner now of three years. Yes. 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 So we will decide if we're gonna stay here or not. At the moment, she still works at the Mayo, and mm -hmm. um, we'll decide if we're gonna stay here or not. Um, that's one of the questions. Um, the other thing is um, we both embrace Europe. We love Europe. I mean, I'm being from Europe. I always have a fable of going there. So maybe we might go back there. I I don't know. You know, it's like. It's like all of the other things that happen in my life. Yeah, your life is one in which things happen and you just kind of take that course when it presents itself. Yeah, it, um, it will be given to me when the moment comes. So what, when you finish your career, 30, 40, 50 years from now, whatever it may be, what do you want people to say about you? Mm -hmm. I want to say that um, he was a good educator. That's it? That's it. You know, um, and when I first met you, it must have been about I don't know, 10 years ago or so, I saw you speak on stage, I saw the stuff you were doing, I said, you know what, you're going to transcend medicine. I'm sure you remember this. You're, you came up on stage, I introduced you, I said, you will transcend medicine. I still believe that. I think that aesthetic medicine is, is too confining for you. The ideas you have and what you create and what you're doing goes far beyond medicine, whether it's your, um, your clothing line or your, or your <laughs> academic papers or whether you're writing books or movies or whatever you I know whatever you do, your mind is not limited by medicine well thank you i i i don't know um we will see <laughs> we'll, we'll see because eventually it'll present itself to you exactly it will present to itself. awesome <laughs> all right um thanks so much for doing this i appreciate you welcoming us welcoming me up here letting me come up getting to hang out with you by your fire drinking beer and eating pizza two of my favorite things to do <laughs> and um, i look forward to when we see you again well thanks so much for coming yep pleasure thank you <laughs>